Good evening and thank you for joining us for this evening's um, Wednesday Wandering. You're very, very welcome. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Now, um, just to say that if you haven't already tuned yet to New Horizon, uh, I can encourage you to do so. It's on this week. Usually, of course, it's in Korean in the tented village and Big Top and all the rest, but it's all online this week. And uh, I can encourage you to do so. Uh, I've listened to a few of the talks so far and I've been really encouraged by them. So um, if you have a look on YouTube at New Horizon NI, New Horizon NI, it should take you to uh, you know the series of videos uh, that have been released. Also, our church Facebook page points in the right direction as well. So New Horizon, definitely worth uh, having a listen to and uh, just engaging with uh, during this week ahead. Now, tonight we're thinking about Deborah and we're reading from Ch Judges chapter 4. Got to be honest with you, I'm not going to get some of these pronunciations right, so please don't laugh as I struggle with some of them because there's some tricky words. Uh, so, yeah, just, just go with me and maybe overlook any mistakes I might make. Judges chapter 4. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud ha was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based at Harasheth Haguim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, the prophet and wife of Lipidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinuam, the from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take your, with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and with his chariots and his troops to the river Kishon, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord uh, will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went with them. Now Haber, the Kenite, who had left the other Kenites, uh, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree of Zan Amnim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinuam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Haguim to the river Kishon with all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. And then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following. And at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. I'm going to stop there. But feel free to read on if, if you wish. You know, you're more... That's, there's no problem with that at all. If you want to hit the pause button and read on to find out what happened next, feel free. We'll talk a wee bit about it uh, in these thoughts. But let's pray. Let's pray. Loving Lord, we want to thank you for your word. And even though sometimes, Lord, it's, it's difficult to understand what it is that you'd like for us to say, we, we know, Lord, that your word is special and that we can learn from it and grow in our understanding of who you are and who we are in you. So, Lord, bless us this night and may we be encouraged. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, during the period of Israelite history, uh, the time of the Judges, uh, which was between Joshua leading the nation of Israel into the promised land of Canaan and the appointment of Saul as king of Israel, the Israelites had no recognised leader. The Israelite king was their God. God was king. And in times of peril, God would raise up uh, someone termed as a judge to lead God's people in the land. Now, after a battle was over, uh, a judge typically resumed their regular life as they did before, 
uh, that before that time when they became the Lord's agent, who was raised up uh, just at that time, a critical time uh, in, the, in the land, a typical critical time that the Lord wanted to do something and he needed someone uh, to lead the people through. So on this occasion of overcoming the Canaanites, God appointed a woman called Deborah to be judge of Israel. Now Deborah is interesting as first of all she's a lady judge, secondly she's also a prophetess. This is an example of a faithful woman used by God in a very favourable way. This is an example of how the scriptures promote the status of women amidst what was always a very male dominated culture. The scriptures show us that God uses both men and women for his work. And admittedly, whilst none of the other judges were female that we know of, Deborah was the only judge described as being both a, a, you know, a judge and a prophet or prophetess in this case. She was therefore a special, unique judge. So in this passage from Judges 4, Deborah called for Barak, a military leader of the Israelites, and told him that God had commanded that they're going to go and fight uh, the Canaanites. And that, uh, that, that they were going to win. That, he, that God was going to deliver the Canaanites uh, into their hands. Here Deborah demonstrated that prophetic gifting. She was able to pronounce the very will of God. She explained that Barak, the military leader, was to go to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men and that God would draw Sisera, the commander of the Canaanite king, uh, Jabin, of Jabin his, uh, the commander of his army, uh, to that place for his defeat. Now Barak was a reluctant general. He was a bit cagey about this one. He told Deborah that he would only go if she went with him. Why he wanted her to be there, we're not sure. Perhaps, uh, you know, he, he he just felt that, you know, there would be an added sense of God's presence with them if she was there. Um, you know, we Deborah agreed, however, and we're told she told him, as a result, the honour of the battle would go to a woman and not him. And fair play to Barak. That was okay with him. He wasn't, he, he wasn't opposed to that. And when the, it came to the battle, as Deborah par- prophesied, Barak's army indeed defeated Caesar's Canaanite army. But if we read on, we will discover that Caesar fled to the tents of an ally of his king. And there he came across a woman called Jael. And Jael told the fleeing Caesar to go into her tent and she gave him a drink of milk and hid him from the enemy. And Caesar thought he was safe and he fell asleep in the tent. And then uh, when he was sleeping, Jael crept up towards him and drove a tent peg through the temple of his head. In a commentary on this passage, the author summarizes Jael in this way. Jael, wife of Heber, handy with a hammer. Now, upon learning that the commander Caesar was dead, Barak's army was able to go on and beat Jaban, uh, the the king of the Canaanites, Sisera's king. The conquest was complete and in accordance, of course, with Deborah's prophetic, prophetic message from God. So what lessons can we learn from this strange story? You might think, gosh, Malcolm, you know, this is going to be a hard one. It, you know, what can we learn from Barak's conquest over the Canaanites, which included Sisera's unfortunate demise at the hands of Jael and her tent peg. Well, the first lesson concerns credit. I wonder if we struggle with uh, the reality of feeling unappreciated, that we don't get the credit that we deserve. Some of us perhaps are struggling with ungrateful family members or unappreciated of bosses or not being able to take on more responsibility due to a misconception that we're not capable or a sense of giving without acknowledgement or others receiving the credit that we're due. Maybe that's a reality for us, that sense of not getting credit for what we give and we do. Generally feeling unappreciated can be really hard to cope with. It can even breed resentment. And aware of the discontentment that a lack of appreciation can encourage, we must be careful to thank one another, acknowledge the efforts of one another, recognise what is done on our behalf, on the behalf of others, and even enable one another to flourish and use the range of gifts that God has given to us. But going beyond that simple reality that we can feel unappreciated for what we do and what we potentially could do, I think Barak shows us something really important. Remember, Barak was the commander that Deborah told to go to battle. While it's nice to be appreciated, we should not crave personal glory 
uh, you know, uh, public glory. You know, we should not crave that sense of public adoration. If you remember going back to verse 8, the start of the Deborah story, Barak wouldn't go to battle unless Deborah was there too. And Deborah's response was, certainly I'll go with you, but because of the course you're taking, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. The warning of his getting not getting the credit for winning the battle, you know, that didn't dissuade Barak. He went for it. But it begs us the question to consider what's our primary motive for what we're doing? Is it to be thanked personally or commended publicly? Is our desire to be honoured or simply to serve? Barak knew that he would not be honoured for the battle victory if Deborah was by his side. But he wasn't focused on that. That didn't dissuade him. It seems he was more interested in making sure that it was, he was obeying the, way, the will of obeying the will of God and that God was firmly on his side. It, the only affirmation that he was really interested in was, you know, that he was doing the right thing and that God was with him. And I guess that's maybe why he wanted Deborah there too. He was not concerned with who was getting the credit, rather focused on what was important, winning, winning the battle. And, you know, we need to draw inspiration from Barak's motive here and apply it to our service of the king of kings as followers of christ ours is the purpose not uh, not to seek praise but to offer praise and offer glory to the one who deserves it all it is he who gives us the abilities the gifts the opportunities that we have for service in whatever we might achieve he deserves the praise above all the commendation we should seek ought to be from god himself like that offered by the master uh, to his faithful servants in Jesus' parable of the talents, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us not seek praise of men and women, but instead uh, instead seek to honour the will of God. So the first lesson we came across concerns credit. Second one concerns prophecy. Now you might ask me, what technically is prophecy? Well, prophecy is about revealing God's message to his people here and now. It's about giving guidance uh, in, a, in a current circumstance. Prophecy can be about telling what is to come, but it's also maybe speaking to what's happening right now. There's a bit of, uh, you know, that in, uh, uh, you know, a bit of forth telling, forward telling uh, in, in Deborah's situation because she was, she was telling, Deborah, telling Barak right now, here now, listen, get in there. Go and do what you're meant to do, all right? Go to battle. Uh, but she's also saying to him, you know, you know you're going to go into battle right now, but you're also going to win the battle. God's on your side. And it should be realised that there are people in the church with prophetic gifts today. There are people in the church whom God will use to speak into situations. And this happens. The Spirit of God guides words and we know God is speaking to us and we experience that realisation of him just giving us direction in our hearts and in our minds. There are also people that God will use to share something about the future. Some will foretell, some will tell about what is to come. They're not fortune tellers or anything like that. People like horoscopes and tarot cards and all that kind of stuff. That should all be avoided, even resisted. But sometimes God will give word to encourage the church or convict God's people if they're doing wrong. And, you know, it's, you know, the prophetic gifts are important. And it's interesting to note that when Deborah prophesied that the honour of victory would be given to a woman, you know, it's easily to presume that she was talking about herself, that she was saying, you know what, if I go, I'll get all the glory, I'll get the, the battle glory. But, you know, it w didn't turn out that way, did it? Uh, you know, if we read, uh, if we read on, as I said already, uh, you know, it, it will become quite clear uh, that the battle honour actually went to Jael, the, the lady with the tent peg. Uh, at this stage, the only lady in the story was Deborah that we, we read about, but it made sense that if we read on, Jael was the one uh, who would get the glory for, for, take, uh, for killing the, Abraham, the, the Canaanite army leader, Sisera, with the tent peg. She was the one that the Israelite army would celebrate not actually Deborah herself. In Deborah and Barak's song of praise, which follows in Judges 5 and verse 24, we read, Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, most blessed of tent-dwelling women. Now, we may have assumed that the glory of the victory would be ascribed to Deborah, but of course, it was encountered in 
Jael. So it comes a lesson about prophecy here. Prophecy can only be properly interpreted with hindsight. Yes, we should listen to prophetic words about here and now. If they're specific, we should discern and respond in the manner that we believe is correct. But especially with regards to the future, there's usually a vagueness that means that we cannot accurately understand what the future holds. It's only in hindsight, like in this situation of the victorious woman, that we can completely understand. The church, that is God's people, needs prophets. We need genuine people of faith endowed by the Spirit of God to speak into our situations, to tell us what is in God's heart uh, for us right now, uh, to hear and be challenged, even corrected, or if the case may be. We need people who are going to speak into the here and now, uh, uh, inspired by God. And such message, messages, they can guide our decision making. But we still need to be wise to the reality that prophetic messages are like jigsaw puzzles. And the real picture can often only be seen in reverse. So the third lesson, uh, first of all, credit, secondly, about prophecy. Thirdly, about praise. After the victory, we read uh, Deborah and Barak's song of praise. I'm going to read you the first five verses of, cha of chapter five. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinuan, sang this song. When princes of, in Israel take the lead, when people willing, willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of, in song, God of Israel in song. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, and the earth shook, and the heavens poured out the clouds of water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. You know, after the great battle, Israel was free. And Deborah and Barak did not hesitate in praising God. Then they blessed God by singing the song of praise to him for what he has done. The celebration of the conquest was focused upon glorifying God. They did not forget whose idea it was to go to battle and ultimately who delivered them from the Canaanites. And I think too all too often, we don't hesitate in going to God in our times of need, as the Israelites did. But we also need to take, uh, take heed from the lesson from them in this passage of giving praise and blessings during our victories. How many of us are living in a victorious time in our lives right now, but we haven't actually attributed any blessing to God? Yes, it's challenging times, but things might be going well for us. Things might be going really well for us, even amidst the challenges that we face right now. Are we praising God for it? We should be praising God for all his blessings. Judges 5, Deborah's response to the victory, the song of praise, you know, we gain a lesson in this. We gain a lesson of responding to God, thanking him and declaring his goodness and his glory, uh, you know, in times when it's difficult, but also in times when we have a lot to sing for. We should be praising God. Too often we forget to attribute praise to God when things are going our way. Too often we don't recognize what he's doing. Too often today we forget, you know, that he's involved and he's blessed us in so many ways. We forget very easily. I wonder today if we're thankful and uh, we need to seek to honour him for the wonderful things we've encountered in our lifetime and indeed in this day we're still able to enjoy. Let's praise God for all he's given to us. Our loved ones, our homes, our achievements, our comforts, our health. There's so much to delight in perhaps tonight and that God deserves the praise for. So in conclusion, the story of Deborah reminds us that we should resist seeking personal glory, but instead desire to serve and honour the one who ultimately deserves all praise. That we should seek to listen to prophetic words, discern what they're saying and respond to, seeking to uphold the will of God. And that in all seasons of our life, we should glorify God, thanking him for what he has done and is doing, even amidst troubling days such as this. So this is a lesson tonight of credit, of prophecy, and of glorifying the one who is the King of Kings. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us, our loved ones and our communities, often in unrecognised ways. Forgive us for neglecting how you bless us. Help us not to overlook your provision and continued care. In times of security and peril, may we recognise our reliance upon you and that daily you are providing for us. 
Yours is a constant love and a constant care. We ask for a growing prophetic voice in your church. Speak, we pray, by the power of your spirit through your servants and help us to respond in accordance with your will, our living God. Refine your church. Expose darkness of heart, disobedience and how we might contradict your ways and what we say and do. Help your church to be light in places of darkness, offering guidance in times of confusion and being beacons of hope and revealing of truth. May move by your spirit, Father, we ask, and help us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we also ask that during this week of New Horizon, that your kingdom would truly be advanced through the explanation of your word. We thank you for this dynamic event, which is a blessing to your church here in this land and beyond. And we pray for church communities taking special steps for your kingdom right now. We pray for holiday Bible clubs, summer teaching events, and any opportunities grasped to help people see and know of your love. Anoint your church, we pray. Equip us for mission, we ask, and help us to see your work being done. And for your glory, we ask all these things. Amen. And a closing prayer, a collect of evening prayer. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good judgments, and all just works proceed, give to your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, thanks for joining us again tonight. Uh, Jeff will be back uh, next week uh, for the next Wednesday Wandering. And uh, I just want to say thanks again for joining us. Hope to see you on Sunday, uh, whether online or in church. And uh, again, God bless and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.